did all kinds of crazy things preparing for my first triathlon, including doing the entire triathlon the day before the triathlon to make sure I could finish the triathlon. <laughs> Welcome to Keep IT Healthy Podcast, the show hosted by people making things happen in technology, aiming to optimize healthcare delivery, health, well-being, and fitness. My name is Jan Kaminski and I'm the co-founder of AppLover, a company dedicated to improving the quality of life with IT solutions and digital advisory. We started making this podcast to amplify great thinking, to propel healthcare forward. Our guest today is Lance Watson, Olympic gold medal coach. Hi, <laughs> nice to be here. How are you? How are you, Lance? I'm doing good. Uh, I think I'm on the other side of the globe from you. Um, we're uh, just stepping into winter and nearing Christmas in Canada. So uh, missing the, the sunny days of summer, but looking forward to some festivities coming up. In our podcast, we always start with like a small intro uh, and the, let's say background of our guests. Could you share your story? I know you've been a coach for a while now. Could you, could you tell us the, the whole story and where did it start and uh, what's your current, uh, I mean, the main, main things that you're doing right now? So um, amazingly, as a teenager in the 1980s, <laughs> I discovered the sport of triathlon um, initially because I was just looking for a way to uh, stay fit. Uh, I, I grew up like a lot of Canadians playing ice hockey. I'd seen and was inspired by Ironman on TV. I thought I'd like to try a triathlon. I did all kinds of crazy things preparing for my first triathlon, including doing the entire triathlon the day before the triathlon to make sure I could finish the triathlon. <laughs> what happened shortly after that was um, there wasn't, there weren't a lot of coaching options in that era. And um, I needed people to train with. I had good organizational skills, good communication skills. So I started bringing together just friends and, people who were into triathlon um, to meet up and, and work out. And of course they would show up and they say, oh, they show up and they'd be like, okay, well, what are we doing today? <laughs> so I realized pretty quickly it was up to me to actually figure out what the workouts were. And those were my early guinea pigs. Um, at that time I was uh, attending university at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver and studying uh, uh, human kinetics, exercise science. And I was lucky enough to um, not only apply some of the uh, theories and, and ideas to the athletes I was coaching. I was I was mentored by some really great um, track and cross country coaches and was an assistant running coach at the university through that tenure. And that's where I really learned how to have athletes at a high performance level at different ages, training for different distances to still work together in a cohesive training environment. So that was a really important phase. I also had the, the good fortune of being able to lead some teams across the country and even overseas in a couple of um, instances. All the meanwhile, I was uh, coaching my own triathlon team and they were having more and more uh, success. Um, better athletes started looking me up. So after university, and this is in the early 90s, I rolled the dice, um, <laughs> invested in myself, my athletes, and did my first uh, European tour. And at that time, it was kind of the Wild West. There was no national federation support. Um, it was completely independent. And um, also the days of fax. <laughs> so I remember sending faxes overseas to places like Poland and Czech Republic and, and that, um, and, and waiting in the middle of the night for the fax to come in, knowing that I was going to get the pickup or the ride for the team at the airport. <laughs> and then you just show up and wait. So as we worked through the 90s, um, we also started going down to Australia with the team. And uh, by the sort of mid to late 90s, I was coaching most of the Canadian national team. And uh, a big moment happened for our sport where triathlon was announced uh, as being a part of the 2000 Olympic Games in Sydney, Australia. So, of course, that allowed us to have a laser <laughs> focus on here's a goal, qualifying for and competing at that Olympic Games. As we approached 2000, I was approached by Triathlon Canada to have the opportunity to move to Victoria, British Columbia, where I currently still live. And be a founder of Canada's first ever national triathlon center with this sole target of aiming for our first Olympics. And a funny story, um, it was uh, about three weeks before my first child was born. Um, and, um, I, you know, I was coaching this great, awesome group of athletes overseas in Australia. And they called me and said, how do you feel about moving to Victoria to launch this uh, training center? And uh, by the way, we can pay you $200 a week. <laughs> and I said, that sounds fantastic. And it was one of those moments where you just follow your heart. 
it, something speaks to you and you say, this is what I need to be doing right now. Um, I was able to bring in a few other international athletes to train with our Canadians. And the year 2000 was one of those years where all, um, all those years of preparation, belief, self-investment came together. And uh, we uh, inevitably, the big moment was we won an Olympic gold medal. Simon Whitfield uh, won the men's first ever Olympic gold medal in front of the uh, Opera House in Sydney. It was a postcard moment for the Olympics. It was the opening weekend, beautiful day. And um, of course, you know, full spread in the newspapers and that it was uh, it was like a, you know, in hockey, it's the Stanley Cup. <laughs> it was a Stanley Cup moment in Canada as well. Um, we don't win a lot of summer gold medals and people were out in the streets banging pots and cheering. And it was just a really incredible national moment and something that shaped me. Um, also in that year, Lisa Bentley, uh, uh, athlete who I ended up coaching for 11 years, won the first of her um, 11 Ironman titles. I coached two other athletes to winning their first Ironman championship. I both I coached both national champions. So it was it was just one of those incredible years where everything clicked. Isn't that like a jackpot for any coach? Just to if his athlete wins an Olympic medal, it's it doesn't matter if it's gold. Any medal is just you know something, right? It's the something yeah. all the all the coaches dream about. A hundred percent. I'm you know I had this athlete Simon Whitfield. Um, He was uh, just, it was one of those great stories where he was just coming into his own. So I don't think anybody would have picked him for the Olympic gold. I saw him on the rise throughout the year, uh, you know, probably um, 10 months out from the Olympics, he was ranked not even in the top 50 in the world. And then he started having some podiums. He started having some breakthroughs. He was outrunning some of the people we knew were contenders Um, he still hadn't won a World Cup or a world-level event, but we knew that he was in good shape. Personally, I thought he had a shot at a medal. And um, I think it was, it was just one of those moments as well where a lot of the contenders going into their first Olympics, our first Olympic experience, they were really, really tight. You know, it was like a lot of tension. And um, a few of them, I would say, just didn't perform to their potential. Whereas, um, you know, we've done so much training in Australia. We, we just you know, set up uh, on, up on the Gold Coast, north of Sydney, and did our normal camp like we always did. We flew down, um, a little bit of uh, ignorance is bliss or naivety coming in, just like it's any other race. Um, we were enjoying the environment. We went through our, our regular preparations, and, um, you know, the day uh, really came together for him. And uh, it, it was certainly a special moment. I, I, I still joke with Simon that um, while he was running down The final straightaway, he had this incredible sprint. I was running through the grandstands <laughs> alongside the finish stretch, hurling people. And I should have got arrested that day because I actually um, hurtled into the press box <laughs> past the finish line, which was completely illegal. And um, so I, I joke with Simon, I actually beat you to the finish line that day because I was uh, <laughs> jumping into the press box and um, called him over after he, he'd won picked him on my arms, shaking him, and then he went completely limp in my arms. <laughs> Did I just kill the, uh, the Olympic champion? But he was just so gassed, and, you know, he sort of had that adrenaline, then he just collapsed. And anyway, the, the rest is history. It was a very special moment, obviously, standing on the podium, having our national anthem played. Uh, all of it was uh, a moment that I'll, I'll never forget and, and really helped redirect my coaching career incredible story but i want to come, come back to the beginning it's like why triathlon probably in the 80s that wasn't the most popular discipline <laughs> i mean yeah, probably... you know triathlon had a bit of a boom in the late 80s it did it was um you know uh iron man was starting to be broadcast on nbc um there you know there were events uh there was a, the vancouver international triathlon in vancouver which had some of the legends of the sport um you know like greg welsh and Mark Allen would come and duke it out there. And, uh, you know, you get 2,000 athletes out racing. So it was a big deal for sure. Um, you know, it obviously wasn't as developed or evolved as it is, you know, since Olympics and post-Olympics. But um, it definitely had gone through a wave and it had captured my uh, imagination. But, but like you said, it was the early days of our sport. I mean, our sport was only born in the 1970s. And... Um, You know, we, a lot of things were being figured out. The first aero bars were put on bikes back then, you know, um, with the clipless pedals. So like all these things were just like 
Yeah, but tell us, tell us about the differences. Like, what was different back then? If you compare the sport now, I'm also not only referring to obviously the knowledge about the sport, but like mm. rules and gear and everything. Yeah, the, the culture, all of it. It was, um, it was definitely a, a different era. I mean, people would <laughs> completely do a full outfit change in the transition area with no tents, and people would be just walking around in the nude, <laughs> getting <laughs> they swim stuff out and putting their bikes stuff on. Um, you know, um, the the bike technology we, uh, you know, again it was before um, the aero bars, so it was all the you know the old handlebars and external cables and down tube shifters and. Um, you know, uh, I remember the first gyro helmets came out and they were like foam with a nylon covering. So you could change the look and the appearance of your helmet, now, all kinds of fun things like that were help happening. The very first triathlon wetsuits started to be, um, you know, created. So when we started, we were swimming in, um, basically windsurfing wetsuits with a big zipper up the front, you know, and they were just like thick and not mobile. And so, uh, you know, this, the sport was really just in its infancy and all the little innovations and technologies. And then of course, in the late eighties, um, one of the things that triathlon was famous for then were the, the original aero bars, you know, that um, the aero that would put the athlete into that kind of almost downhill skier, like aerodynamic position. And um, the one thing I'd say about triathlon is it, it had always, it's always been an early adopter of technologies. Like a lot of companies will actually come to triathlon because the psyche of the triathlete is, a little bit adventure seeker, um, trying big new things and that. So different things will get tried out. And, uh, of course the most famous aero bar moment was, uh, Greg Lamond in the tour de France who took that technology there and, and won, uh, the, the yellow Jersey in the final stage using those aero bars. So another great, uh, triathlon moment, but yeah, yeah. it was a lot of fun back in those days. But were you uh, were you connected with any other endurance sports like running or, or something else, or you started with triathlon and you always been connected with this industry? Uh, you know, I ran a little bit of track in high school. Just was always active. Um, but again, you know, I, I just saw triathlon. I was enamored by the idea of just being really fit. Seemed like they were the ultimate athlete. So you know, and I was a teenager. I thought, oh, I want to give that a try and. You know, I went out and uh, did my first event, and um, uh, the one thing I remember was just such a welcoming community. Um, you know, I, I, I won my junior category, which didn't say a lot. There was probably three of us or something like that. But what I do remember were the older athletes were just so congratulatory and supportive, and I just, you know, really felt welcoming. And and um, that probably was what got me hooked, you know, the obviously the challenge of dealing with the you know, covering the distance, but also just um, feeling like this is a really great community to be a part of. And, and you know what else I'll, I'll also say is it was probably um, the first time I've been in a, in a sporting environment where athletes or people of all different ages competed together. And I was able to see people who were in their 50s, 60s, 70s, out there doing triathlon and it kind of gave you a vision of like this is not just you know high performance sport but this is sport for life and that was really appealing to me as well and i know you've been a part of many like coaching camps and um and events like that and been involved with promotion of of triathlon in general in the world but how did it change the, the promotion the marketing of a sport in those let's say 30 years as I see the, let's say the the communication that goes for mul multiple triathlon brands, like Ironman, etc. It's rather like very there are a lot of business people training. I'm not talking about the professional level. I'm talking about the amateur level. I see that a lot. A lot the communication goes there at least like in seventy percent. I mean, the sport really has exploded worldwide. And um, early days of Ironman in Hawaii, that 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 was the first catalyst. You know, um, having some kind of national or international broadcasting. Uh, the Olympics obviously took it next level as far as awareness. Um, I, I remember um, back in the early days, you know, people, what's a triathlon? Is that like skiing and shooting or what do you do? You know, and, and then, you know, after the Olympics, you know, you go, you go to the bank or you, you'd be at the grocery store and 
people knew what, what a triathlon was. They, you know, maybe they knew somebody who did one or they had a brother or cousin or something like that. So it became a little bit more part of the, you know, within the vocabulary or the consciousness of the regular person. Ironman, of course, is a private corp and has been the, the driver of participatory age group triathlon uh, worldwide. You know, so through the 2000s, um, they had a bunch of uh, sort of franchisee type um, events, and then they they owned a couple. There, there was probably only eight or ten Ironmans uh, worldwide um, at that time in the in the full distance, and a few more 70.3s. And um, you know, then as they were um, bought out by uh, private equity. That, you know, they became you know, more driven towards uh, sport and growth of the sport, which to me actually is, has been a, a fantastic journey. Um, you know, it's what it's really done is it's helped bring what is a lifelong, a healthy pathway sport to all corners of the earth. You know, it, it's still being discovered by new countries. You know, it's going into countries with real um, emerging economies and people are starting to have you know, a little bit of disposable income, they've, they've got a little bit of time. And, you know, it's, it's like triathlon in the 80s and early 90s, where it's new, and it's exciting. And, and um, it's, it's giving another area, you know, on the globe, we have a pathway to towards lifelong fitness, you know, and, and community and health and, and that great environment. Do you actually use technology a lot right now when you're training your the, the athletes that train with you or not really? You still focus on your old ways or maybe not old ways, but the, the traditional ways in a sense, traditional approach to that. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, uh, coaching back in the days of waiting for faxes <laughs> and the emergence of, you know, email, massive breakthrough, the Internet, massive breakthrough, of course, um, and then things like power meters. And heart rate monitors became innovative technologies, and then they became mainstream. And then wearable technologies, GPS, were innovative, and then they became mainstream. And so when you think about coaching, you know, there is a human component, a relationship component, and that's never going to be lost. The coach-athlete relationship, paying attention to the human being, how they're reacting, how they're responding uh, emotionally, mentally. Mm -hmm the holistic approach of everything that's going on in their life is, is but, foundational to a mm -hmm. successful coach athlete journey. Is it supported right now with actual data, not only the feelings, but like the data? hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. So I guess I, I'm, I'm reemphasizing that the holistic approach and the relationship is foundational to a successful athlete journey. We've, what we've seen is that we have access to more and more technology and data to make less emotional, more data-driven decisions about what the athlete should do as well. So we're able to monitor and direct based off of, you know, a, a quicker um, acquisition and analysis of what the athletes are doing. So if I was going to put it in, into simple terms, it's an incredible world now where I can have an athlete on the other side of the planet um, receive very specific indications around percentages of their threshold output, their power targets, um, which are fed into a smart trainer, which will auto control what they do step by step by step through their workout. They're gathering their body responses. Um, they're gathering, you know, their heart rate feedback. I can see their cadence. Um, we can, we have things like monitoring sleep and HRV and heart rate variability. So we can actually really see how the athletes are responding specifically to the indicated training, which will then allow us to better fine tune and adjust and adapt the periodized journey. But then again, as a coach, you know, I'm able to get that feedback, that data instantly. I'm allowed to, I'm able to not only curate it, but use um, some online video analysis type uh technologies that are where they they may not only be performing a swim workout but they'll have a smartphone on deck which is capturing video and i can break down their technique and the evolution of their technique as they progress through the set and we can manage or we can have a look at that and say how did that affect your stroke rate in the pool how did that affect your heart rate in the pool 
And by the way, what's your recovery look like the next day? And then I can get onto a video conference with them, <laughs> like we're doing right now. And um, we can have a heart to heart and, and an educational moment as well. So here's what the data said. This is also what the intention of the workout was. How did you execute it? And oh, well, you had a tough day at the office. Um, you came to the pool mentally flat. Is, you know, are there strategies in life that can help you get more out of your training or do you adjust to your training expectations according to what's happening in life too? So that's how it sort of all comes back together, you know, taking this um, incredible you know, volume of potential data to anal analyze and, and then overlaying it and interacting with the, the human being on the other end as well. Is it popular among coaches? I mean, if you try to guess what's the percentage that actually uses all those tools and data and wearables, et cetera. You would say that uh, the use of data and wearable technology is pretty mainstream right now. Um, there is going to be different levels of coaching understanding, <laughs> experience, um, integration. Um, different coaches have different styles, you know, and, um, and different athletes have different aptitudes as well. You know, it's, if you're talking to, uh, you know, an Olympic coach who's leading a national team, like you're also tend to be working with, you know, lifelong athletes there. And they're beyond that kind of, we call the classic stages of learn to train, learn to race, learn to win. You know, they're in the, the learn to race, learn to win phase. So, you know, it's tip of the iceberg stuff that's going to move the needle for them. If you're working with an athlete who is just entering their, their triathlon journey. Um, they're discovering sport for the first time as a 40 year old. Um, they're going to have different aptitudes of how much information and data they can actually absorb. And quite frankly, as a coach, you're going to use this, this technology, but the guidance and mentorship plays a bigger role for that athlete than the, you know, experienced long-term veteran who is uh, you know has to do a lot more things quite a bit more specifically to make those marginal gains how did it transform the coaching landscape you know how it impacted uh, coaching methods in general maybe even yours and interactions with athletes well i think what with the growth of triathlon worldwide um, there's a lot more volume of athletes. And what we're seeing now is that there are a lot more athletes now who are coached than there were 20 years ago. So if I go back to the uh, the dinosaur days of <laughs> coaching, um, you know, the conversation back then was, you know, well, coaching is for elite athletes, but, you know, not for me. I'm just doing this for fun or whatever. And there's still a lot of athletes like that. But now what we're seeing is that athletes worldwide of all ages and of all abilities still believe that it's worthwhile to um, invest in their own knowledge and understanding, seeing what their personal potential is. So what we're seeing is that the mid-level of triathlon is getting stronger. And then the depth of the high performance amateurs in every age group is getting a lot stronger too, because there are that many more athletes worldwide who are receiving great coaching and are also learning how to use that those technologies and those wearables themselves to help guide and direct their output on a given day so that they're having a more effective journey. Essentially, there are more athletes turning up prepared for these events, which creates a better uh, competitive environment as well. And you'll have more athletes pushing each other on the day. Probably there is one aspect that isn't really affected by that. So the mental aspect of training and like competition and triathlon. So how do you help athletes develop the you know mental toughness required for the for the sport? Mental training is called mental training for a reason. It's training, <laughs> you know, and you can shape and reshape the way that the mind reacts to stimuli. So uh, you know, on a, a real basic example. You know, in back in the old days, when you go to school and you're doing physical education, and if you're a bad boy at school, the teacher makes you go run laps around the field. <laughs> so you grow up with this whole mental reaction to running and physical stress as a negative experience, right? Like, yeah, okay, I'll go and do that run, but it's going to hurt. It's going to suck. <laughs> and that's not a strong place to um, not only train day in and day out uh, with, but also to race from too. So a lot of times, um, particularly with, 
you know, athletes coming into sport at a later age, it's reshaping the way that they think about and process training and racing. Uh, the other thing is uh, going back to the technology piece, because <laughs> there, when you talk about holistic athlete, you're talking about life and how it impacts them, but you're also talking about right. how they manage their journey with training. And data can be um, an incredible piece to build confidence and understanding the body and really shape your process. And that, that might be by putting caps on output, you know, like putting a ceiling on what you should do and then getting confidence out of not going crazy and blowing up and self-doubting and, and that. Um, on the other hand, um, the data can also get in your head a little bit too. Um, you can start to become a little bit of a training robot where you're just chasing numbers every day and you kind of lose that organic experience of, hey, I'm outside riding my bike and it's a beautiful day and there's <laughs> the ocean and, and um, you know, I just feel like going hard for a while just because it's fun to go hard, you know, and it doesn't have to be, 277 watts right now <laughs> you know it can be just like i'm just going to push so it's an ongoing journey of uh, preparation analysis learning education preparation analysis learning education where we're going through this cycle of getting an athlete ready to go do a practice being you know engaged on task immersed in what they're actually doing in the moment, changing the lens or the perspective that they look at that activity through, and then having post-analysis and learning. So it's not beating yourself down. Oh, you suck today. <laughs> you know, it's looking at, okay, where were you on task? How was your self-talk in that moment? Were you intrinsically focused on biomechanics, on run economy, whatever? Did you waver any points? Where did your head, where did your heart go at that moment? How would you do it differently next time? And probably even more importantly, what would you replicate next time? You know, what did you do right? What would you replicate? Because that's what we want to be able to do over and over again. Creating a mental, you know, environment that they can go into a sporting event, into their big race and be able to replicate. So they get really good at focusing and refocusing when they're out uh, on in the race environment as well. But did you have um, many examples like that? So people that were too focused on numbers that really lost all the joy out of the sport? 100%. Um, you know, I, I guess I would say with coaching experience, you actually learn to guide athletes. And um, I, I talk about periodizing. We talk about periodizing your, your annual training program physically, right? You know, doing your endurance, your threshold. We also talk about periodizing your, your annual program mentally. And that means changing focal points. So every week through December, you're not training for the Olympics. <laughs> you're thinking more about general environment. You're thinking about training with family and friends, maybe uh, having a little bit more fun at practice, having a bit more of a playful approach. And then as you approach your A races, your big season, you get more into Superman phase where, okay, you know, really trying to dial in these workouts, be really on task really dig deep, deep and, and, and process. So when I think about my journey, um, I mean, I could give you countless examples of elite athletes where um, you may have a, um, a, a real hardcore athlete who you're always trying to let, we say trying to a little bit, let a little bit of the air pressure out of the tires on that athlete, you know, like trying to have them be a little bit more relaxed. Um, you have, sometimes you have the anxious elite who you're trying to bring a little bit more joy back into it you know, or, or um, being focused. So great, great example, Lisa Bentley, 11 year uh, coach athlete career uh, through all her Ironman wins uh, at one point was considered probably the best runner in the sport. Um, one of the top two or three um, Ironman triathletes in the sport. And we actually created a weekly structure for her to get ready for her Ironman events where she would spend um, a good portion of the time simply thinking about the kind of attitude, self-talk experience she wanted to have on that Ironman course, because she was such a driven athlete that she could get nervous and wound up. So we talked about finding joy in, on the course, having themes on the course, um, getting energy back from the volunteers and people cheering so that she could just carry that foundation of happiness throughout the day. And if that was lost, she was not able to then get into 
executing the fitness and the competitive stuff. Like she couldn't even get there because the fa- that foundation of just the attitude of gratitude wasn't in place. What are your thoughts on the potential for the triathlon growth and the improvements that will occur in the discipline in the coming years? Well, it's interesting. I, I think, again, if you go through different phases of the history of our sport, there have been different technologies that come along that allow us to have breakthroughs. You know, whether it's, um, you know, the ability for athletes to log and cross-reference multiple technologies um, and to be able to share that immediately um, and then have professional advice from a coach to guide them through and understand what they're using, how to use it. What's coming down the pipe right now, which I find super interesting, is AI and uh, artificial intelligence and how it's going to impact the coaching industry. Now, AI is never going to replace the coach's role as far as humans are always going to need human contact, right? They're always going to need another person on the other side. That's just hardwired in our, in us is, you know, in, in our genetics, but what it's going to allow us to do is to more quickly curate and cross-reference more data automatically and have a platform, which can not only crunch way more numbers more specifically for that athlete, but make suggestions or adjustments automatically to what that athlete should be doing next. So then the role of the coach becomes less about, you know, sitting down in front of that one graph and taking segments and analyzing what happens here and here and here. And it becomes more about using a super tool, (laughs) which gives you a deep, deeper insight into the athlete's journey. And then being more of your energy will be focused on guiding the athlete educationally and, um, you know, wholeheartedly and spiritually through this process, keeping the, you know, the, the life things on track and then being able to more specifically and quickly make adjustments and direction um, shifts according to what the athlete is experiencing physiologically. Bridge a lot of gaps for different coaches who have different levels of expertise in different areas of technology as well. Do you think it's that industries cared of those changes or they're actually embracing them? I think it's how you frame it or how you, how you process it, because uh, it's like anything that's new. Um, people are going to be skeptical. You know, the classic is, oh, well, you know, this can't replace me or, well, you know, am I going to be out of a job or, you know, and the reality is um, I think of it as a super tool. I just think of it as a, a way to supercharge what we're already doing. So a way to refine our, our professional journey and help athletes on an even deeper level. Yeah, and probably it will also make, let's say, the industry uh, more competitive in the sense I see like my Garmin and hit the, the Garmin's recommendation for me as a completely, complete amateur for my triathlon or for my yeah. running are actually pretty accurate based on my da- data. And- yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And of course, then there's the occasional day where you feel like you had a great workout and it's Garmin tells you that was ineffective. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're like, come on, Garmin. Um <laughs> No, you're, no, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, and I don't know if more competitive is the word. I I think what it's going to do is it's going to allow, uh, you know, an even more scalable uh, ability for coaches maybe to help more people, but for people also to access AI to help guide themselves. And again, that's not replacing the coach. I think that's just more athletes or more people who are participatory exercisers to be able to do it a little bit more precisely and the net outcome of that is that you're going to have more people who re-identify from somebody who dabbles to oh i'm actually a runner right this is something that i do regularly oh i'm getting this feedback of this data from my chat gpt coach (laughs) you know who has been crunching my four technologies that i'm using and um, i'm starting to learn about myself when i'm i'm a runner but, you know, I really could use some guidance here. I really could use a mentor here. I really could have, I really could have some help from somebody who understands this better. I'm going to get a coach. So I actually think it's one of those things, kind of like Iron Man, going to all different corners of the world. It, it brings more opportunity to engage more people into a health, fitness, lifestyle, and perhaps athletic journey, which benefits everybody in the long run. How do you see the future of triathlon coaching? you know, given the increasing accessibility of advanced tools, you mentioned advanced techniques, what, what, in your opinion, might change? 
well, you know, I think we're going to sit in a uh, 3D hologram room and um, I'm going to be able to like auto control the athletes. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's hard to forecast what the future brings. Um, right now, again, I believe uh, AI, the companies like HumanGo who are, you know, creating predictive nice. adaptive mm -hmm. platforms. I mean, it's, it's incredible what they're doing right now. Um, it's going to change the way that coaches, I, I think where they spend their time focused, like it's going to allow them to have more time to help the human. And it's not that their understanding of the technology is going to be irrelevant. It's not, it's more that they're going to be able to come to summaries of what the athletes are doing that much more quicker and with, with a deeper insight because they're cross-referencing maybe eight technologies instead of two. <laughs> so they're able to get a, a, a more in-depth, broader picture of what the athlete is going through uh, physiologically. And then as a coach, as a mentor, they're able to better guide the athlete more accurately through their own training progression, but also through that athlete's personal journey, which is going to have inevitable curveballs of my kid came home from school sick <laughs> or yeah. I'm going to a wedding or all the things that happen in life that uh, AI is just not going to be able to account for. Not yet anyway. Or what have been some of the most memorable moments in the coaching journey? What do you like, really remember from those 30 years? Recently, I was inducted into a Hall of Fame. and. Um, People are like, wow, that's like incredible. You, you know, you, you must be a legend or all, all the things that people, you know, associate with that. And that was never my focus as a coach. It wasn't like I'm going to do this so I can have those accolades in the long run. When I think about my career, I think about just all the people that I had the good fortune to help guide, be a part of their life, the friendships that I fostered along the way. So I probably could go through every single athlete I coach and can think of like wonderful moments with that athlete and, and some tougher moments as well too, but all the things that helped shape. So, you know, of course, winning an Olympic gold medal was an incredible moment. Um, you know, I've, I've put other athletes on podiums at world championships, which were incredible moments for those athletes. Um, I had the great fortune of coaching an athlete named Brent McMahon from the age of 15 to his last professional world championships in Nice just this year in 2023 as a 43 year old. So I, that, that was a longevity study in itself of how the work you do with a teenager plays out through all the different phases of their career. So, you know, I, I can remember Brent setting a world record for the fastest debut Ironman. I can remember him qualifying for his first Olympics. I, I, I can remember him standing on the podium at an ex Terra off-road world championship. Like, all these um, incredible moments. So I guess to bring it full circle, you know, at the end of the career, <laughs> you get inducted in this hall of fame, but it's, the joke is almost like, well, I guess I've been doing it long enough and I've been focusing on it long enough that I've had enough moments that they kind of all added up. But when you're in the journey, you're not thinking about that. You're just engaged with these athletes, their goals and trying to help them. And, and just as importantly, sending them out in the world after their careers uh, as happy, healthy, functioning, intact humans <laughs> who, you know, have used sport to enable and springboard them into the next chapter of their career or life as well. Yeah. And then you also train not only the athletes, but also the coaches. And is it as hard to train a coach as it is to train an athlete? Coaches, uh, I guess you would say they coach for different reasons, but generally you've got a group of people who want to you know, be a part of a sport journey, uh, whether it be uh, high performance or participatory I, on an innate level, you know, most of them want to help people <laughs> and they tend to be really good humans that come into it. You know, I, I think if I were to hit rewind and go post Olympics 2000, and I spent the next six, year, six years building our national triathlon center. And one of the things I really loved about that, one of my roles there was coaching education and actually building a framework of education for coaches. And a lot of those coaches that came up through our center ha went on to have great careers. And for me, that was super rewarding, you know, was to be able to share what I learned in part upon them, what I had experienced, bring them into an environment, see how I run a practice, 
but then have them put their own signature on it, their own flavor on it, go out and have their career and express themselves in those different environments as well. Coaching education is something I'm absolutely passionate about and um, I love, and there's nothing that gets me going more than being able to sit down and have a cup of coffee with a coach and break down the minutiae of the different elements of our sport. Maybe before I ask the question, I want to give you a, some the, the thought process. In, for example, in Europe, we have a lot of ultra triathlons that, and there was a big discussion about this not actually being a sport, but this actually being harmful to the to the community. But it actually makes triathlon as a, as a discipline very popular. Because I see that from my perspective, of course, not as a pro, I'm, I'm not connected with the industry but I, I, itself, but I just follow mm. the, the news and what I see there. It's like the people, either the, these people actually make big media outbursts and like they're very, it's become very popular in the media, right? And some people mm. say it's good for the discipline and some people say not, not really because that's not really sport. There are all kinds of different proliferations of sport from sprint olympic ironman and then we're, we get into ultra too and that might be um ultraman which is a double ironman um, but there's ultra running um, essentially all lumped into the category of ultra endurance sport and and in effect ironman itself is an ultra endurance event when you have an athlete who's out there for 15 hours working hard that's a long time to be out there i think the question is while it garners a lot of media spotlight, is it actually a healthy pathway for an athlete to follow? And how I like to think about Ironman, I'll just use that as a, a more common um, example, because that's something that's probably in people's consciousness, that, like maybe one day I could do that. You know, especially if you go and spectate, you'll see all different people from all different walks of life out there getting it done with whatever God-given skill set they've got. As a Mount Everest bucket list experience, it's so empowering. I mean, because you were finding out that the human body is capable of doing a lot more than you ever thought possible. Like if you think about the distance that you cover in an Ironman, like I am never, I never stop being amazed, being on the sideline of an Ironman, seeing these athletes come in after hours and hours and they, and they still have to go run a marathon. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> That's an incredible amount of distance to cover. It really is. It, and, 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 and the human body is able to do that. But then you get into the question of miles, mileage on the odometer. <laughs> so it's not just doing the event, but it's the training and the repetitive training for these ultra events. And I, I would be, I, I'm going to be completely honest with you. Doing these events goes well beyond health and fitness, and it becomes more uh, challenge and accomplishment oriented. What I love about the sport of triathlon is it's a lifestyle sport. It's swimming and biking and running. So it's it's not overuse of one sport. There's variety. There's an adventure element, which is great for your heart and spirit. But you can also do different distances. And the 70.3 half Ironman distance is still a real endurance challenge. But it doesn't take you to that break point in life where you have to put life on the side so you can focus on it for a while. But it also doesn't have the wear and tear. You're going to have some athletes who are just really resilient and can do it, but they're the exception to the rule. And, you know, and then there's all kinds of other theories around how it might impact your heart in the long time, long term, et cetera. I, I mean, I would just say generally it's better to be healthy than not healthy and better to train than, than not to train. So yeah. I don't think I could comment on that from an expert perspective. My final thought, though, is what I've observed in the last five or seven years is that athletes are starting to re-identify again. And by that, what I mean is in my sport, athletes are not necessarily thinking of themselves exclusively as triathletes anymore. They're more starting to think of themselves as endurance athletes because there are such a greater variety of participatory or competitive experiences out there year round. And that's everything from running, ultra running trails, gravel riding, cyclocross, mountain bike, open water swimming, swim run events with multi-stages, uh, Grand Fondos, multi-stage bike events. So athletes are taking that wonderful hard-earned fitness and they're applying it in a broader variety of playgrounds. And to me, in the long term, it's way healthier.
rather than being solo focused on doing a whole bunch of really long events, one after another, after another. You might get away with it for a few years, but it catches up with most people after a while. I know that there are a lot of tech companies usually listening to our podcast. And I know for most of those solutions, usually the coaches are actually a decision makers when they're implementing so some SaaS tools or some wearables, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to ask you like, if you're the one recommending something to your athletes, what should be the communication of a potential startup that wants to approach you? Like how, what's the sweet spot, you know, how should they do it? Yeah. I mean, the first thing you need is a smart watch. I mean, just heart rate, GPS, all the other metrics that it provides, um, cadence, vertical oscillation, like there's probably more than most people need <laughs> just in a regular smart watch. And, and I would start there. I would say for a new athlete, combining technology and, but then going back to sort of the old values of creating community around yourself too. So find somebody to go to practice with, maybe somebody who understands the technologies that can help guide you a little bit, but by creating an environment where you're happy training, that's even more important initially. But, you know, I, maybe I would say that as a summary, philosophically as a coach, I've always been very open to trying new technologies to understanding what's coming down the pipes. But I've also been very careful as far as looking for that latest, greatest silver bullet or special thing. Uh, I like to see that a technology is tried and true and effective before I ask my athletes to try and integrate it into their training regime and also going out and uh, maybe opening up their wallet <laughs> and spending money on it too. For the audience, for the viewers, if they want to learn more or follow your career, where can they find you? Sure. You can look me up at lifesportcoaching.com. That's where you'll see all the great things that we do. Um, everything from one-on-one -on -one boutique, uh, the exclusive coaching. Uh, we have Tri Club, which is a live online interactive training club where we actually host live practices that utilize all that great te technology we were talking about, but in a very simple to use manner. And, and it creates a great community as well. And um, probably their best place is just on Instagram at coach.lance. Thank you very much for sharing the story. It's quite inspirational. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, and I hopefully see you soon. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you today and thanks for including me in your show. Stay in touch with us, subscribe to our podcast, give us a like, comment or share. If you want to reach out personally, you can find me on LinkedIn and Instagram.